So welcome to the Investing into Alternative Energy event. So first of all, a few housekeeping points. Um, can people please turn their mobile phones off? Um, I want to say a very big thank you to Nex for hosting this event and for giving us this amazing room to work in. So um, before we start, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to who I am, and then um, I'll introduce the panelists here, and hopefully we should have a really interesting discussion today. So um, just to give you a background, for those that don't know me, I'm David Scrivens. I'm a founder and director of the Amberside Group of Companies. So within Amberside, we are mainly three companies. One is an advisory practice that um, advise on debt and refinancing in the infrastructure and renewables arena. So we've done more than five billion pounds worth of debt transactions. So, and then we have Amberside Energy, which is a technical consultancy firm that specialise in renewable energy and enhancing the value of assets. And then we have another firm called Amberside Capital that help private investors invest into infrastructure and energy projects. So um, I don't want to say too much about myself. Uh, the panel here are much more interesting. So if I just quickly introduce, first of all, we've got Victor Hill. That should be known to most of you. Victor is a um, one of the leading writers for Master Investor, so please make sure you read his blog. Um, Victor is a financial economist, a consultant, trainer, and writer, and he's extensive experience in commercial and investment banking and fund management, and his career stints at JP Morgan, um, Argyle Investment Management, and World Bank IFC. So we're very privileged to have Victor here. So the next company I'd like to introduce is Powerhouse Energy. Now, Keith Allen of Powerhouse Energy is CEO, and um, never really a week goes past without plastics being in the news and the problem with waste plastics. And Powerhouse Energy have a really good solution to this, and so really hope it actually comes to market, and we'll hear more about that in a minute. And the last company we have, uh, but by no means least, is Prem Biomass, so we have both the co-founder, which is Yatish Chuhan, and Hartley Booth, um, who have come to join us and tell us a bit more about, basically, um, an interesting area of biomass fuel and using that fuel to create energy. So I'd just like to pass over to Victor to say a few words first. Well, thank you, David. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for coming. And if I'm not mistaken, a number of you have been to previous uh, Master Investor events. I think I recognize a few faces. For those of you who don't know uh, what we are, we are not in the business of giving investment advice, but we are very much in the business of putting new opportunities on investors' radar, both uh, retail and institutional investors. And we are a media company. We have a, a website, which I hope you will visit from time to time, masterinvestor.com. And we have our annual uh, show in London, which is the Master Investment uh, Investor Show, most recently in uh, March uh, of this year. Um, we'll be having a number of other uh, smaller uh, uh, customized events such as this one going forward, and I hope we'll have the chance to tell you about those uh, before you leave this evening. So just why am I here? Well, um, I'm really here more to ask questions than to provide answers. Um, it's a topic that fascinates me. I've been writing around the theme of renewable energy for uh, about 18 months now. I even uh, published a lead article in the Master Investor magazine in the summer of last year on climate change, in which I suggested that actually, while this is probably one of the biggest challenges to humankind, if not the greatest challenge we've ever had, it might just be the opportunity to totally re-engineer the way that we do things. And to that extent, it will provide plentiful opportunities. Now, during the course of tonight, I'm sure we'll be talking about a number of different types of renewable energy. And I'd like to just look, if I can, uh, at the economics of these different sources of renewable energy. And I'd like to look at the, 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 the feasibility, the extent to which we really can aspire to go carbon neutral because I'm afraid that I, I, I'm a skeptic in that respect and I'll try to share with you some reasons why. But just very quickly to proceed, um, within the huge universe of uh, renewable investment opportunities, there are niche players 
who are doing extremely interesting things r using proprietary technologies. And I think we're very privileged to have uh, two of those on the panel tonight. And I'm sure that what they share with us is going to be extremely illuminating. So I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Yes, well, th thank you. Uh, Victor's an economist. I'm actually a biologist. And I take a look at the ecosystem in which we're operating in the macro ecosystem in which the world finds itself. And we take a look at, at the recent uh, report that came out this past week, UN Climate Change, that, that provided headlines for us suggesting that we have 12 years to do something of epic proportions to make a difference in terms of global warming and climate change. And I'm not here to, to cast aspersions or, or assign blame to any species regarding climate change. But the only species that can make a difference at this juncture is us. And so I ask that you take a look at what we can do uh, as individuals to make a difference in terms of renewables, in terms of reducing our impact on the environment with which we're dealing. One of, one of my advisors coined the phrase that we have the solution to plastic. Well, I've got to say we have a solution to plastic. And that is that we can take plastic and convert it into the most efficient economic energy source available, which is distributed hydrogen. And distributed hydrogen therefore allows us to produce transportation, for instance, with zero tailpipe emissions. Allows us to produce this, this hydrogen without the CO2 impact that the majority of, of hydrogen today is uh, providing to the world. So I think that we've got, we've got a novel technology. We're excited about it. We're just turning the corner. I describe our, our company as a company that's, that's uh, eight years old and, and we went public about eight and a half years too early. So we're literally just turning the corner into commercial, commerciality. And now is the time to get involved. David's not here to, to make investment advice. I'm not here to make investment advice. But if I were investing, I would think really strongly about PHE. <laughs> I'm going to stand up. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yatish Chohan, founder and uh, seed investor in Prem Biomass. I would like to take this opportunity to invite you all to participate in our unique value proposition. Prem Biomass is a commercial opportunity with a, so a social conscience. We embarked on this journey in late 2015. Um, Bertel Peterson and I uh, realized the demand for biomass was very high and uh, has been increasing since 2012, um, especially after the nuclear disaster in 2011. We did test exports for market research uh, with biomass waste from palm oil producers in Indonesia supplying Japan. Um, we realized power production uh, produce power producers had a, uh, in Japan were s looking for secure and reliable sources for feedstock. Prem Biomass business model aims to provide small scale modular power plants, power plants driven by self-generating self biomass uh, feedstock to areas in developing world having an inadequate power supply. And Prem Biomass is also has a positive environmental and social impact. Phase one is focused on producing and supplying bio biomass material. Phase two is to construct modular power plants and also supply biomass material. Ghana and Cambodia have both been selected because uh, they're in the equatorial uh, regions of the world, which gives uh, high, high agricultural yields. Both have stable investment, uh, investment climates, pro-government support uh, for adopting renewable energy with legislated uh, pricing structures. We have, we have secured arable land in Ghana, just under 7,000 hectares in total, and securing agricultural land and 
uh, acacia tree plantations for harvesting in Cambodia. We have three parcels we're looking at at the moment, just under 1,000 hectares. We have selected napier grass and acacia trees for biomass material. Acacia trees are accepted by power production uh, units in uh, Japan and Korea. Processing requirements uh, are three to four centimeter chips with moisture content below 25%. Napier grass has a high calorific uh, value and in principle it can be used as a substitute for fossil fuels. Um, it, has high water, it has high water use efficiency, high yield per unit, four th 400 tonnes per hectare per year. Napier grass has multiple of uses from animal feed to biofuel pellets and also uh, the byproduct is cellulosic uh, liquids. Demand for biomass is high and reliable supply is needed in the market, especially in Southeast Asia uh, with the demand from South Korea and uh, Japan. There has been exceptional growth in companies um, and the policies being put place to promote the industry. And Japan is a prime example of the demand following the shift for to biomass after the nuclear disaster. Enviva, a leading exporter of wood chips and pellets from US to Japan, grew by 500% in the last five years. The long-term vision is to be among, th among the global leaders in delivering biomass material and producing power in rural areas and off-grid. Prem Biomass, as I mentioned, is a unique value proposition for investors with projected revenue at five years, circa 120 million, with a gross profit margin of 30 to 40 percent. We have a pre-money valuation at the moment at 8 million. We're offering 25 percent equity for 2 million dollars. To conclude, biomass is the source of sustainable energy and we would like you to participate in our journey. Thank you very much. I'd like to pass it to Dr. Hartley. I'm here as the non-executive director to show you that we have a broader team. I'm Hartley Booth, and um, I've been proud to work with uh, Yatish now for many years, nearly 11 years. And um, I can vouch for his integrity and his incredible application to detail, which is what we need in this particular field. I've uh, been fortunate in being interested in the environment for most of my life. I was the environment advisor to British Prime Minister for four years, 10 Downing Street, and have watched with great interest how beside our garden at home, Miscanthus is grown, two eight foot high, rather like the elephant grass here. And this elephant grass is used in Britain already now to power, um, power stations that, are, that need this fuel. I also had uh, uh, experience of uh, starting a small business with, with others, and it's now grown big over 30, 40 years. And so seeing a small business grow has been a great pleasure and something I can bring to the table. And I've also worked in the Foreign Office where I was involved in a ministerial post. And particularly, I, I took on a a job as a trade envoy in Asia, where I had to help people with um, the, the, the bravery to go to difficult areas and encountered uh, all sorts of difficulties. And I can see how uh, Yatish and the team here may encounter the odd difficulty, but I've been there and know how to deal with corruption, know how to deal with all sorts of problems that uh, people encounter in starting businesses in emerging countries. And so that's why I'm there to help. And, and finally, I'm there to be a lawyer. So I, I would be the, the uh, well, I'm a barrister actually, but still a lawyer. Um, I, I'd be the uh, Rottweiler to make sure that the corporate side of the company go, goes according to plan and investors' interests are safeguarded. Also, I want to introduce uh, Bertil Peterson. He has an amazing career. He was uh, from Sweden, got to Harvard in the United States, where he studied um, 
uh, uh, sustainable economics. And over 40 years, he's produced a very successful business in production systems. And he's in the who's who for international finance. And uh, key to us at this point is the fact that he speaks very good uh, Japanese. And he it was who produced our first uh, contract that's going to be announced when we, we launch shortly. Uh, and that is that we've got a, a contract with a huge company in Japan for 5,000 uh, tons per month for 10 years for our biomass product. And then finally, last but not least, in California at this time with Bert Hill, is uh, Jean Smith. She was, um, apart from giving apologies tonight, she, she, she was director for 25 years since 2003 of a, of, a, of a senior banking corporate business, and her speciality was uh, Covanta Holdings, which amazingly was waste to energy. So she's very much in our field, and we're very glad to have her. She took the co his, her company onto the New York Stock Exchange, and we're going to be, we hope, on the Stock Exchange here in Britain in three or four years. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to add a bit of context? Well, <coughs> thank you, David. I, um, Keith referred to the IPCC report, which I think you will all know came out on Monday. And uh, in my personal view, that's a game changer. So le le let me tell you why. Um, this is a report which is saying that in order to avert catastrophe uh, by the year 2030, we have to aim to reduce the increase in global temperature above the pre-industrial level, which is normally considered to be 1800, to just 1 1.5 degrees centigrade. Now, why is that in I important? Because the Paris Accord uh, of 2015, which we've all heard of equally, was based on a projection of a rise of no more than two degrees centigrade. So we're going from the two degree target to the 1.5 degree target. Now, as you will also know, <coughs> the global temperature is already estimated to have risen by one degree centigrade since the 1800 benchmark. So actually now we only have a one half of one degree uh, room to play with. And that's, that's all we've got, which is very little. Now, what the new IPC report is saying is that we must reduce our carbon emissions across the planet effectively to zero net net of course there will always be some uh, emissions but they could be counted by carbon capture uh, to to zero by 2050 now I just have two comments on that and I'd like to come back to um, both of these two uh, distinguished uh, panelists First of all, um, when I got interested in this uh, last year, I kind of asked around and I spoke to a few climate scientists and I said, is there a text which actually explains you know, the, 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 the economics of renewable energy? And amazingly, there's a, there's, there are no short of, there is an infinite number of academic papers, but is there one book which permits you to get your head around it? And somebody told me, yes, and it's this book. It's by... Uh, uh, an eminent uh, academic called Professor James Mackay, and it's called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, which I'm sure you've heard of. And this was published in 2009, okay? Um, Bill Gates, who I think his opinions are worthy of note, says it's the most important book he's ever read. Now, uh, I should say, unfortunately, very sadly, Professor Mackay died of cancer, aged only 48 years old in 2016, so he's no longer with us. But this book is still basically the only uh, quantification of the economics of renewable energy. So I don't want to bore you with the details of the book. Y you're free to read it. Uh, it's pretty heavy going. It's 350 pages of very closely argued uh, engineering science uh, with quite a few charts and, and graphics. Um, but uh, I just take away two points, which I'd like to pass over to Keith um, and to colleagues for comment. The first point is that um, essentially uh, sus renewable energy will never be cheaper than energy generated but from hydrocarbons. So whatever uh, scenario we look at, we're going to have economic implications in terms of the impact of 
uh, energy prices on our economy as a whole. And you might say that that's already been manifest in the UK economy because thanks to a gentleman called Ed Miliband, um, largely, he has an, a, a, a great achievement, we have managed to reduce our carbon emissions very substantially in this country, but at the price that the cost of energy has gone up relative to our competitors, not least in France, which is largely nuclear dependent, and in, in Germany, which is certainly ahead of us in terms of, of, of solar panels and wind. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point is that you are never going to have enough renewable energy in the world to sustain our present consumption levels, even with a pop global population of 7.5, 7.6 billion people. <coughs> and, the, 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 you, you know, I'll just, I'll just give you a couple of snippets, if I may. So what uh, Professor Mackay uh, says, that if, if we wanted to uh, power the UK with wind alone, assuming current levels of consumption, we'd need effectively to have a wind turbine of average, or, or, or a two megawatt wind turbine, that's quite a substantial structure, for every 700 people, okay? So uh, roughly every football pitch would have to have two of these uh, turbines. Now, as well as the fact that, you know, um, I the cost of installation, the payback, the economics of it uh, are very much questionable, you're gonna have an awful lot of people from the Not In My Backyard Brigade protesting against that, and, and with some justification. I know you might say we can put those, uh, those, um, th 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 those wind turbines out in the sea. That's one potential, but then you've got to get there to maintain them. So there are all kinds of cost impacts uh, for that. Um, if you wanted to power the whole of the UK by solar panels alone, about 20 to 25% of the entire land mass would have to be covered by uh, PV panels. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. Okay, you might say, well, we can increase efficiency. Well, the maximum theoretical efficiency of a solar panel, I am told, because I'm not an engineer, I'm an economist, is 31%, and we're already at 20%. So there will be increases in e efficiency, but they won't solve the problem, ultimately. So at the end of the day, we've got to really draw back very dramatically in terms of our actual consumption levels. And uh, since uh, the report was published on Monday, we've had no end of people on television, experts, so-called, telling us how we've got to go around on bicycles and we've all got to become vegan vegetarians mm -hmm. and cancel our holidays and uh, basically turn the heating off completely, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. you know, what they're telling us is that we've go got to go back to pre-industrial levels of, 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 of energy consumption. That's not gonna happen. Okay, so where, before I hand this over to, to Keith and to Yatish, um, really, what, what do we take from this? Well, one thing is that it's very doubtful that we will ever go carbon neutral, certainly not by 2050. I mean, one thing you could do is to reduce the world population level, but, you know, how are you going to do that? Um, birth control, but, you know, th there are moral issues here as well. That, that would probably be a major... We could ask our American friends mm. to reduce their consumption since their consumption per capita is twice that of the European level. Mm. <laughs> I turned the lights off before I got home. But at the end of the day, we've got to think in terms of carbon capture, and that's where I think Yetish might have more to say. And uh, I, uh, just to finish, the most efficient carbon capture technology is trees. Okay, there is massive deforestation going on in Brazil, in Indonesia, and other tropical countries. That is a major issue that we much, uh, must address as a matter of urgency, it seems to me, as well as rolling out PV solar arrays on prime agricultural land in the south of England, where I come from, which could be turned over to vineyards, may I say, <laughs> in this lovely yes. new weather that we're having. So carbon capture and Finally, we've got to think about um, strategies for adapting to wa a warmer world. You might say that's defeatism, but there are uh, huge advances in like flood, flood uh, protection technology and so forth. But these are things we've got to uh, really get our heads around. So it's not, I I this is a battle that we have to fight on many different fronts, of which one is renewable energy, uh, solar, wind, um, 
tidal power and so forth. There are also these niche technologies which are going to uh, help us to reduce waste and to help us in our aim to recycle all this plastic that's going into the ocean. And there are also you know, the, 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 the biomass route as well. So I just give you a few ideas um, to pass over to you guys to see how you might work with them. It's like an MMA fight here this evening. You know, <laughs> I've got to say, for those of you who are expecting a light evening uh, discussion, I'm, I'm uh, somewhat in awe of Victor's uh, analysis of truly the crisis that we're facing. And, it, and it, it, it is not an overstatement to say that we're, in fact, facing a crisis. And the sooner we wake up to that, the sooner we can start taking steps to do something about it. The, um, the possibility of the world becoming carbon neutral by 2050, I, I can't tell you what the odds are of that. I can tell you that if, uh, if there is massive adoption of nuclear energy, then you might have a chance of having some kind of impact there. But there are, there are more than generational issues to deal with in terms of nuclear energy. Victor mentioned Bill Gates. Bill Gates is one of the largest investors in, in nuclear energy. I don't consider nuclear energy to be a renewable source or an alternative source of energy because there are still substantive long-term, like lifetimes, generations terms, safety issues associated with, with parts of that. So it's got to be part of the ecosystem. And I, I started my presentation or my introduction by saying I'm a biologist. I do look at this as we're dealing with an ecosystem and each part has to do its share. Now, one of the things that our technology allows us to do is to extract energy from the 8 billion tons of plastic that's been created since 1950. Now, I didn't realize until one of my colleagues was telling me earlier today that, that plastic was originally created to save elephants. We didn't know why, why plastic, you know, we don't think about, why do we even have plastic? Well, it's because they were making billiard balls and they were killing elephants. And a man put out a 10,000 pound, this was in 1840 or something of that nature, 10,000 pound award saying, if you create something that allows us to make fake billiard balls, then I'll give you 10,000 pounds. Now that sounds wonderful, but then there are these unintended consequences that we now face, which is that every bit almost of that 8 billion tons of plastic that's been generated still exists on this planet. And unfortunately, it's degrading, it's, it, it's being abraded, it's turning into, it's moving into our marine ecosystems, it's moving into our ecosystems inland, uh, throughout the forest, throughout the world. It's starting to cause choke points uh, in rivers. It's causing massive flooding. It's causing, there, there, there are substantive negative consequences with the mismanagement of plastic. I am not, in a war against plastic. I am in a war against the mismanagement of plastic. And that's what's been going on. And the challenge that we face is, it, particularly in emerging economies, is that if your choice is to use a sachet of something that you can afford, as opposed to go hungry, and that sachet comes in a small, it's a small plastic sachet, you're gonna use that sachet as opposed to saying, you know what, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna buy that because it comes in plastic. So we've gotta find ways to help support the world. Now, the, the argument about whether or not renewable energy or alternative energy is going to be economical is one that we really need to evaluate because one has to really figure out what did Adam Smith really mean about economics, right? And is it about dollars and cents or is it about human lives? And so there are a number of, there are a number of things that we've got to balance here. And I tell people that you can't have a company that's going to save the planet unless that, that company is also sustainable, unless that company is providing returns to its investors because that's the way the markets work. That's the way the invisible hand of the market works. 
And so we've got to be providing returns and we've got to be protecting the environment in which we operate. Because at some point, the comedian George Carlin once had a, a very poignant statement, which is that Mother Earth is going to be okay. It's humanity that's going to be hurt. And he didn't use the word hurt. So, so well, I, th I just want to just interject to this point, and I'll bring back to you. I mean, one of the key things here is we're talking about very evangelistic um, points from Victor here about you know what we need to do as a whole. But actually, we can bring it in a little bit about what we as an investor group can do for impact investing. And that meaning that we're investing in things that make a real difference, but we make a return at the same time. And it's one of those things that is the new topic, I think, of where we, you know, as private investors should be putting our money for actually, we're making a proper return on this money, but at the same time, that money is doing good. So we need to just be a bit more careful about where we're going. I mean, and Victor, I think, lined up nicely for Prem to, um, to talk about is to talk about the environmental impacts about growing napier grass instead of um, potentially crops. And I'd, I'd love you to sort of respond to that now. Well, um, Yadish has asked me to, to s at least start off on this because uh, it is desperately important. And we, we can all be, sh well, we can all share your concern about the planet. And indeed, there are, there are uh, professors like Professor Farrelly in Rome who, who says that if you can only harness one tie tide of the world, you have solved several times over the world's eco, uh, world power si problem. And he's been working on that for 10 years. And, you know, uh, amen if, if Professor Farrelly wins. In the meantime, we have got um, a sustainable um, system that needs no penny of grant aid. No, you, you say that, that uh, this biomass stuff needs grant aid. Not, not at all. It can make a 35% profit, which is in our business plan. And we aim to do that. But not only that, we wish to give back. We have a social conscience. For each one of our small power stations, we're going to put a school, and we're going to, to have um, a give back um, mentality in whatever we do. It's so it's sustainable to the community as well as to the power system and, and to the investors who will get uh, money. And I just wanted to, to say that um, when Yatish is going to finish this, but, but <laughs> when we do look at the planet, it is, it is a jigsaw puzzle of, of measures and initiatives such as Prem Biomass. We know we can do it, we can know we can do it at a profit, and we do not need grant aid. Can, can, can I just say that um, I'm hugely enth enthusiastic about renewable energy, which is, let us recall, the fastest growing industry in the world. So th you, you know, it must be on investors' radar. It's something we simply cannot ignore, not only because of in the environmental reasons, but because it is a growing global industry. And I had a statistic, I think, um, from one of the uh, US um, uh, e economic agencies, that for every one job that's being lost in the USA in coal, about 112 jobs are being created in renewable energy. So perhaps Mr. Trump might like to reflect on that. Un <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think he, he reflects on much. <laughs> so one of, one of the issues in Africa in particular, and one of this, there's a big trade-off between you know, doing the right thing and making everything carbon neutral, and the fact that many Africans are sitting there without an electricity network. There is no electricity in communities. And so, I mean, Yatish, that's there's one of the things you're solving. Well, yeah, there's uh, 7 million people without electricity in Ghana, for example. Uh, we have uh, uh, the, uh, the grass we are going to grow, napier grass, is uh, self-sustaining. It grows uh, every year. We could grow per hectare 400 tons. And as you just talked about carbon neutral, we have a vertically integrated system, which is carbon neutral because we're absorbing and we're releasing, so it's uh, the cycle. So we, we uh, think uh, we have the right concept to uh, produce electricity sustainably. May I, may I ask a question as well? Um, 
I think it's very important as we start looking at the economics, the, 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 the broader economics, and I absolutely applaud your approach to the social responsibility aspects of energy production mm -hmm. and the idea that you're going to be creating schools and you're going to be doing those kinds of things. Investors as a whole, in my mind, are starting to look very seriously at how corporations are governing themselves. How, what kind of social responsibility are they taking? The kind of, of, of protests that we saw um, five, six years ago on Wall Street regarding um, the, you know, excessive compensation and a wide variety of things where companies were not providing the kind of return, social return, to, to the communities in which they were operating. I think that that is part of what is going to become ingrained in the entire investment cycle. We're no longer just going to be looking at what are the dollars and cents. Yes, everybody is concerned about what the dollars and cents are, and so it has to make sense. But we also want to know what are we doing to give back to the community and to help the community sustain itself, because without it being there. Okay. Can I comment on that? You can. Um, <laughs> I, I looked recently at what the oil majors are doing <coughs> in terms of renewable energy, and they are making a huge uh, display of the fact that they're diversifying into solar panels and wind power and other types of I renewable. I love that word, display. Now, the, 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 if you can't get a, a you know annual report from from BP or or Exxon Corporation without seeing a windmill on the cover, right. they say you ah. didn't see any oil. <laughs> now, the, the, depending on who you talk to, and I'd like to know your view about this, uh, Keith and, mm -hmm. and Yadish. Um, these oil companies are either doing it because they foresee a green future, medium to long term, or they're doing it because they need the PR in this in, the, in this campaign of corporate social responsibility. Um, because at the end of the day, these guys are still expand, uh, extracting huge quantities of hydro more carbons and more from, and from the earth. They just started <laughs> fracking here in England. They have right. Yep. It's just in, 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 uh. and I come from a country where the expectation was ten years ago that the cost of natural gas was going to skyrocket. Mm -hmm. And then fracking began. And all of a sudden, natural gas plummeted. And so people who were investing in biomass plants, power plants, found themselves well behind the curve. I happen to be living in a city that, it, that invested in a 102 megawatt biomass plant, Gainesville, Florida, where the University of Florida exists. And they literally just last year had to purchase their way out of a 30-year power purchase agreement that, that was 40% higher mm -hmm. than if they retrofitted a coal-fired uh, coal power station with natural gas. So, uh, so I think that, that we're starting to see, um, we're, we're definitely seeing the big oil companies making a display but they're making a display f for the reasons, I, and, 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 and perhaps I'm, perhaps I'm uh, a little bit too cynical, but I believe that they're making money, right? Their job, their principal job is to continue to make money. And their job isn't to make money 100 years from now, it's to make money next quarter, right? And so until we start taking, again, kind of a generational approach, which is going to be a shift in how we observe and how we absorb and how we engage with corporate governance and, and corporate directions, and we stop saying, look, next quarter's profits are the most important thing, mm -hmm. then we're going to still see companies having to focus on things like, let's extract as much damn oil out of the tundra as we can as opposed to let's invest in, in, in additional renewables, additional biomass, additional options, and other technologies that allow us to decarbonize the planet. Until all the carbon is gone, somebody is going to try to extract it. Well, and as the oil price goes up, so the incentive to extract it yes. becomes greater. Oh my goodness, greater. yeah, right. Um, I, I mean, the oil companies are not the only hypocrites around. Oh my goodness, um, yeah. I was in a beautiful country uh, two months ago. I was in New Zealand, and they were, they were explaining to me they are the first country which is on the threshold of becoming carbon neutral. And mm. I said, well, what about your coal mines? 
And they said, well, you know, um, that doesn't matter. We export all our coal to China. <laughs> <laughs> what about their sheep? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious. The second largest greenhouse gas emitter in New Zealand is their sheep. Right? We, we don't think about that. The fact is that mammals, particularly cows and sheep, excrete methane, methane, methane yeah. which is far more damaging as a greenhouse gas. And, and so, so it's, it's wonderful. It's like we've created so much land for these sheep to graze. And isn't it beautiful? Yes, it is. But you're right. They, they, oil companies are not the only hypocrites. And the fact <laughs> is that we're all faced, again, it's a balancing act. It's a juggling act. It's like, how, how do you provide the, the greatest good for the largest number mm. of people and still serve your shareholders, still provide that extra percentage that allows you to outcompete the other people that are competing for that same scarce resource. So it is not a, it's not as simple as just beating your chest and saying, go environment, right? Because we all want our pensions to grow. We all want to make sure that we're invested in something that's going to help us um, expand our lives, help our children, help our grandchildren. And so we're going to look at all of those <coughs> things. Well, I mean, if we all became vegans, what's going to happen to those fine dairy farmers? You know, <laughs> yes, right. Absolutely. someone's got a plan for that. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. So I, should we, you teach, do you want to say anything on that subject? Uh, I, I believe we have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think Keith has said uh, everything. Really. So, so just <laughs> I, I'm, I'm think, gobsmacked here. If we bring um, it back in a little bit. Yeah, to I just so wanted to make one point. Um, I think we have a very good uh, proposition with Brem Biomass. We uh, grow grass and uh, produce electricity, self-sustaining and carbon neutral. You can't get better than that. Win -win. And, uh, and, uh, and also uh, harvesting trees in, uh, in Cambodia, we will be growing trees again too, yep. so, uh, which captures the I mean, the, the only issue, if I may say so, Yatish, and I'm be kind of playing devil's advocate here, is that for every hectare of, of napier grass that you're growing, you're taking a hectare of corn out of production. Uh, not, no, necessarily. not necessarily, no. no. <laughs> I think that's the wrong no. statement. No, um, that's not right. But okay. it's, cer it's certainly well, an argument. Tell us. It is, yeah. tell us. The fact is, uh, in Ghana and, and in many of these places, um, first of all, um, in, in Cambodia, the trees are there already. Uh, and so we're just harvesting what is there as a crop already. But in many of these areas, uh, it has not yet been, been used. I mean, if you're possibly uh, very keen on birds, well, you know, we may be taking some of the the um, forest away, and that, that is, there is an argument there. But if we're talking about energy, we are using land and developing Africa, we hope, which is uh, the most underdeveloped uh, area of the world. We are looking at places that are going to produce four crops a year. And, and uh, so let's help Africa, help ourselves, help the world, and, and get uh, bi the bio circle of beneficial results, including replanting trees, replanting whatever we put in, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and just make it a good circle. Yeah, the virtuous circle is clearly something that we've got to look at. But mm. it, from, a, from a devil's advocate standpoint, the, the challenge that one faces in producing additional energy for, for a, a new generation of population that's going to continue to grow and their economy will expand and they will continue to consume. Well, we happen to operate in one of the fastest growing resources in the world. It, it may grow faster than, than Napier grass. It's called waste, mm -hmm. right? And so we're dealing with a problem that is massive. And, and, and so this virtuous circle, unfortunately, contributes to it. And so as we bring people up, as we provide opportunities, we've got to provide um, investment in technology you're going to do it uh, we're going to do our part for sure they're yeah. going to need we're going to need every solution we can find Absolutely. to help solve this over the long term but it but as much as there is a virtuous circle there is also a vicious circle that we've got to be aware of and be aware again of the trade-offs and what are the balances that we're facing so should we i mean 
we've talked a lot about some of the the bigger picture stuff. No, I think. Have. Well, true. <laughs> um, <laughs> your pitch at the start about what you do. I think there were some really interesting points in there that would be nice to before I throw out to the audience for mm. some questions. Some things I'd just like to pick up that you said that uh, would be interesting. So your technology, mm -hmm. as far as I understand it, um, turns plastic into d uh, hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a chemist, but I think there's a lot more chemicals within plastic than there is you know, just hydrogen. So Indeed. what about all those other bits and what so does your technology do there? The, the fact is there's not, and, and, and Yatish could well argue with me, but there's not a silver bullet. There, there simply is not a silver bullet when you're creating energy. The fact is that our process is as virtuous a circle as one can create as it relates to plastic, as it relates to high calorific um, petrochemical wastes, things like end of life tires. So you look at things that, uh, this, th th that are actually long chain hydrocarbon and our thermal conversion chamber allows us to effectively break those molecular bonds and reconstitute those molecules into energy and an energy source. So we're able to extract 50% of, the, of this ecosynthesis gas that we produce. We're able to extract that as pure hydrogen. We're, that's road quality fuel. That is something that allows us to divert diesel for every gallon of diesel that we can divert, we're diverting 23.8 pounds of CO2 that's going into the air. Right? There were there were 14, I'm sorry, 16 billion road miles of HGV use in the UK uh, in 2014, which was the most recent study I could find in terms of HGV road use. These guys are getting 12 miles to the gallon. Right, so it is a massive CO2 footprint. So all of a sudden, if we're taking an existing pollutant, which is plastic, and the, the vast majority of plastic is not recycled, I don't care what processes we have in place. The, the, we're not seeing 100% compliance with recycling anywhere on this planet. And we're certainly not seeing it in developing countries. And we're, in fact, not seeing it here in the UK. So the, the UK is still uh, producing 51% of its, of its uh, energy from uh, fossil fuels. And so it's not all going to be alternative energy at this juncture, but we've got this plastic crisis. And unfortunately, we don't even know what the end result of this crisis means. We don't know what this plastic is actually doing uh, to the coral reefs, to the the continued uh, warming of the oceans, which seem to perpetuate things like the hurricane that just hit my former home state of Florida yesterday. The, the, the climate change that we're facing because of these kind of unforeseen consequences, we don't know the answers. We don't know what chemicals are in our food chain at this juncture. What we do know is that we can take any plastic and effectively recycle it into a viable s form of energy, electricity and hydrogen. And that hydrogen can displace fossil fuels, can displace diesel, can allow us to create zero tailpipe emissions and do it in a distributed manner that allows us to inexpensively power industrial transport. We can sell, we can produce and sell hydrogen at a price that is on par with diesel and petrol today. So, so Keith, just yes. to stop you there, because you're okay. Um, you, you've talked about the hydrogen and, yes. and, and power. What about plastic has a lot of other chemicals in it? What no, no, to it? It, but it made there. Well, what do you look, do with it's, those? It's carbon. Other bits? It's, they're, they're cycling, they're VOCs. What about sulfur, they're, for example? Uh, so, so, you've got furons, you've got sulfurs. Some of these things you precipitate out and you capture as cake. Some plastics have zinc in them as and stiffeners. Does you your technology? Them. Absolutely. So anything there is a residue. Th there is a l minor residue. So you, it depends on the feedstock, right? If it's napier grass, you're going to end up with some calcium. You're going to end up with some mineral content that comes through because we, we end no, no, up with so the biochar but, as a yep. waste product. But biochar can be used as fertilizer. Indeed. For, uh -huh. for and, and plastic, 
that's residue, though? There's mm -hmm. a slight, it depends on the type of plastic. So, for instance, there, there's almost no uh, residue for PET. But what, it di what minor amounts of residue there would be would be uh, non-leachable carbon. Um, and, and effectively, it's far less than 1% mm -hmm. of the volume of material that's going through the process. So it's minimal, to say the least. Now, again, I'm not, we, we're not trying to compete with, with biomass. Uh, the, the fact is, we can run biomass through our thermal conversion chambers. That's fine. But the, what we are trying to do is provide a solution to this plastic crisis. Because there are people saying, look, plastic's not, all plastic isn't recyclable. It is in our process. We can take PVC, the most difficult plastic to deal with, and deal with it and provide an energy source, in effect, recycling it, bringing it back into the economy. C could I just ask, Keith, in terms of the, the hydrogen that's captured, um, how do you propose to utilize that? I mean, um, hydrogen question. vehicles are <laughs> out of the question. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> the canisters that hold that hydrogen would have to be extremely heavy, would they yeah. not? So it's not going to power cars. Uh, what, what, what would you use it for? So v um, I, I've got to challenge you on that, Victor. It will, it will indeed power cars. So Toyota has made a commitment of 40,000 Toyota Mirais by 2022 operating in because Japan. Because you, you compress it. Because you, you're compressing the hydrogen. You're putting it in a carbon fiber container that is actually lightweight. The, the, but the challenge with hydrogen, if you see uh, uh, an HGV going down the, the, the motorway with canisters of hydrogen in it. You see a 40,000 pound vehicle going down the road carrying 750 kilos of hydrogen. 40,000 pounds of steel is, is required to carry that 750 kilos of hydrogen, right? So not even a ton of hydrogen is going down there. So the, what we are are uh, hypothesizing or we're, we're advocating is let's create hydrogen where it's needed, which is frankly everywhere, as opposed to creating it at land's end and then trucking it mm -hmm. at massive expense, in massive compression expense around the country to then power these things. Our belief is that industrial transport is going to be leading the way in terms of the hydrogen economy. Uh, ultimately, if, if one looks at power throughout England and, and one can look at, I think, the H21 study that, uh, that Dan Sadler and his team did out of Leeds, um, he, 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 of all of the power that's created, the biggest power user in the UK is heat. And so what are you going to do to create heat? Well, we can inject hydrogen into the pipelines, into the, into the gas pipelines. But Ultimately, one of, and one of the things that you brought up earlier is how to bring hydrogen back into the f full circle is going to require the, the complete um, embracing of a, a carbon capture technology, CCS, that allows us to, to engage in large-scale carbon creation. In the meantime, our silver bullet is that we can create hydrogen where it's needed. We can create it at a distribution center where you've got trucks going out during the day with products. They're coming back with waste in the evening, plastic waste, uh, uh, packaging, et cetera. And we can convert that overnight into hydrogen to fuel them. We can do that for buses. We can do that for council fleets. Mm -hmm. So there's a variety of ways to do that. And it helps solve this plastic problem. Now, the, the plastic problem, and I, and I could go on, you I know. Think you can go on for quite a long time, actually. I can, but, um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. So, <laughs> yes. I think what you're also saying is you can do it on a relatively small scale, so you yes. can put these things around the place in a very succinct manner there. Um, so, just going to Prem Biomass, just from what you said earlier and about your strategy, I got half of the strategy being that you're producing um, Sort of wood chip and these pellets from the Napier glass to, s to supply energy companies, mm -hmm. but you're also looking at doing microgrid generation yourself. How does that balance of a conflict of interest between one customer that's going to think that you're competing in its same territory? There, there is no conflict at all. We're, uh, we're looking at rural areas, 
and uh, we believe this is going to be a rural uh, revolution for electricity supply. As I mentioned, in Ghana, there's seven million people in rural villages that do not have electricity. So growing grass, napier grass, and having a modular unit, maybe one megawatt or two megawatts, will supply a quite a large population in the rural area. Thousands of homes. Thousands, Thousands of, yes. of homes. Yes. At that size. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And also, we, we're also considering how we're going to get it to uh, the people. We have uh, the energy storage uh, units that we could use, which charge up in the modular power plants. And the people come and charge, and they take it away with them to power the houses. So uh, there's, uh, there's all these advantages that we, we think with our concept. Um, uh, it w it's, a, it's a benefit to people. <coughs> And you told me earlier you were something like four months away from turning this concept into, into actual yes, cash. I, as soon as we uh, start, as soon as we raise our first tranche, which is two million, we'll be four to six months away from operation. So I'm now going to put my financiers hat on and sort of just drill into a little bit on that one. Um, so you're looking at two million now, and you're saying it's 25 percent of the company. Mm -hmm. um, you've got ambitious plans to to grow, so I'm presuming that's not enough money for your, your plans. Well, how much are you looking to raise in total? In total, it's 10 million. So in the next uh, eight to nine months, we'll be doing another raise of 8 million for, for the second tranche. So, so basically, a tranche now, $2 million, mm -hmm. and then 8 million in sort of almost 12 months' time. That's so a right. bit earlier. Yeah. And what do you think the relative valuation at that second tranche would be? So the valuation is 8 million at the moment. The yep. second chance valuation w would be in the region of uh, 25 to 30 million. Okay, so you're thinking a real good uplift for those That's initial right, investors. Yes. Okay. So I think at this point, it's probably a good idea that we've talked enough and asked questions. Is there anyone in the audience? Hi, my name is Somi and I'm from Nigeria, which is close to Ghana. Yes. So one question for Keith, from an economic perspective, what would you do when the world runs out of plastic, all of your companies? <laughs> <laughs> and from a social perspective, I mean, the, the more you grow in Ghana, the more land you need, which would take away, we would have even be talking about not having corn, we would be having none, no food at all at that mm -hmm. point. So that's on one part. And on the other part, um, the gentleman mentioned that trees are actually good for carbon capture, but you're cutting down trees to, to use them for your yeah. solution. You're growing them again. How long does it take to grow the trees back? Or shall I answer? I, you, carry, carry on. So foot questions of the land yeah. issue in Ghana. Go on. Um, well, I mean, you can grow, I've, I've grown an arboretum in, in Norfolk, you can grow a very good arboretum in 12 years. Um, it depends what you grow. And in fact, the, the trees that we the, uh, are growing, acacia trees, you can get a crop out of them in about 10 years. And so so uh, that, that's a recyclable crop. And, and we have looked at the food requirements which you raised and uh, there is no food shortage, nor predictable food shortage, in any of the areas that we're going. But uh, we will certainly, as part of our community social work, we'll make sure that there is no shortage of food. How, do you, how would you do that? If necessary, we will return some of our land for ordinary agriculture. You know, we, we have to be responsible. We also are interested in doing Lo local hospitals and so on. It is the whole holistic community support that we want to give something to them, they're going to clearly give something to us. It's, it's, it's a two-way street. Okay? I'll accept that for now. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Sonny, can I ans mm. answer you? The, the, the world's not going to run out of plastic. <laughs> I, I'm, so, I'm, okay, I'm sorry, you know, there, there, there's eight billion tons of it that in, in our m small modular facilities operate on 8,000 tons a year, right? 8 billion tons of existing plastic. Next year, 300 million tons of virgin plastic is going to be created. The oil companies are going to continue to support plastic. 
the fact is, plastic is a miracle substance so in many ways. So you need the oil companies to still be around, and in that case, for your business to be sustainable. No, I don't need them to be around. No, absolutely not. The plastics, right? the, I, 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 if one begins, at some point, one can start looking at things that, that are truly advanced, some advanced technology, things like landfill mining or extracting plastics from uh, places where they've been, uh, where they've lied dormant for a period of time. But plastics is not the only thing that we need. It, it, we happen to be a solution to solving the current plastics crisis. But just to give you an order of magnitude, 300 million tons of plastic, virgin plastic that will be created next year is equivalent to the mass of every man, woman, and child on this planet, right? Plastic is not going away soon. It does things like create incubators for newborn infants. It does things like create food packaging that allows food to be sustained for, for much longer than, uh, than it has been historically. And so plastic's gonna be, excuse me, is gonna be around. End of life tires. They certainly, we'll have advances in chemistry and, and figure out how to make better tires that are less destructive to the environment. But burning them is not the solution. Incinerating them is not the solution. Burying them is not the solution. They are a massive vector for malaria throughout Africa. And so we've got to get rid, and they're, they're, a, they're, a, they're a ticking time bomb, right, in terms of fire hazards. So if we can take the energy value that exists in those and extract that and turn that into something worthwhile for your community, then we're gonna do that. Now, if we run out of tires and we run out of plastics, first of all, you and I are gonna run out of time. And, but, but there are going to be alter other sources that we can utilize to convert into efficient electrical and hydrogen energy. So we've got some other questions. Go on. So this is for, for carbon biomass. So I, can I ask you if it's your source for saying uh, biomass is around 60% of total final renewable energy by 2030? Do you mean that uh, so 60% of renewable energy would be biomass? Sorry, I had yeah. to. So yeah. Yes. Of, of renewable energy. Yeah. So that, do you mean that 60 percent of renewable energy will be biomass by 2030? Does it mean? Ye yes. And can I ask you, like, what is the the source for the forecast, or, or we this is just the forecast <coughs> of your company? No, this this has come from the United Nations. Um, uh, Source. I've got. I've got it details. M maybe I could give it to you later. But I have. We have. We have researched this in depth. All right. Okay. Thank okay. You. And, and also, so you're saying that after year two, your, your margins are thirty-five percent. So yeah. I would like to ask you: Is based on on revenues, or is it like low cost that you're going to achieve thirty-five percent? It's on revenue. Revenue. Yes. And do you, need, do you, need, tough, do you need to have that broken down? No, yeah. I, I'm just curious because I normally the renewable energy that I go doing is usually, I don't know if I'm, I, it's between 6% and 8% at the moment and also some companies might generate like 19%, but that's like a, a geothermal. So I find 35%, I, I'm just curious. No, that's uh, the reason why we've got good margins is uh, because of low entry cost in Cambodia um, and the prices that are being paid by the end buyer are, are a premium for the wood chips and wood pellets. So uh, that's, that's the reason why we have good margins. We are, ver we are very conservative in our for, uh, projections. I must say securing biomass fuel is very difficult because in the UK we didn't invest in a project because there was a biomass plant and it couldn't secure good quality um, fuel stock, a food stock for a, a long enough period in time for it to be a worthwhile investment. So even in the UK we have the problem of not having enough good yeah. quality biomass. We, we are looking at Europe. Uh, once we have a stable supply 
type of pellets and uh, ha and supplied the uh, uh, the regional demand, then mm. we'll look at the European market. David, you're itching to say there is one uh, producer in the UK called Drax Energy, yeah. Drax, which yes. is producing electricity in Cambridgeshire mm -hmm. from macanthus grass, that's if right, I'm yes, not mistaken. Yeah. Yes. So yes, sorry, well, that's that's what beside okay. our house. Oh, you know it. Yeah. Hi, my question for Keith is: um, uh, um, what's it, How do you gather waste, uh, the plastic? Uh, how do you manage? Was it this plan to to get the, the waste? Mm -hmm. uh, and what's the price? What's the cost of, of getting this plastic? And how much is going to cost? That's twenty-five tons of. That's an excellent glory. question, and um, we're actually not in the waste business. We're in the business of managing waste problems for other people who are in the waste business. So um, plastic recyclers have tons of plastic that is non-recyclable, that is ended up dumped in their environments. We have um, auto uh, shredder residue that is non-recyclable plastic. And numbers of people pick this stuff up, and they actually then uh, pay us to take it. So the, the interesting situation that we're in is that we don't pay for our feedstock or the fuel. We're paid for it. Now, we're paid for it by virtue of the fact that in lieu of, of these people paying us to take it, they can pay the landfill to take it. And in the UK, the current landfill tax is I believe it's 88 quid per ton, something of that nature. So if we offer people 70 quid uh, a ton, uh, if it, we uh, allow them to pay us 70 quid a ton to deliver their plastic, they've just saved 18 quid per ton, and they're happy to do it. So we're in late stage conversations with people whose job, whose livelihood uh, is collecting waste uh, plastics, waste tires, wastes in general. So we will be partnering with, uh, with uh, large uh, multinational waste companies to ensure that we have adequate feedstock. The fact is that the 46 incinerators that operate in the UK currently is not adequate to deal with the waste problem that the UK faces. We, the, the UK is currently shipping thousands of tons per year offshore of waste to be incinerated in places like Sweden, where they're converting that into, into um, electricity and into district heating. We can expand the capacity of those incinerators that exist by something in the order of 10% by helping them reduce the plastic that is going through their process. Because incinerators are not built to operate at the high calorific value I that is produced by plastic and end of life tires. They, it, it, when you have long chain hydrocarbons in there, it destroys the, the incinerator. So if we operate next to an incinerator, for instance, or near one, we can help them extract the plastic, extend their life, increase their throughput without having to build another incinerator or put one, as Victor says, in my backyard. Right? They already exist. There are 46 of them out there. We anticipate, and there, there's been a study done, and, I, and forgive me, I, I can't remember from where, but they anticipate that to manage the industrial use of hydrogen in the UK by 2040, we're going to need something in the neighborhood of 1,000 four quarts that are providing hydrogen, right? So we're definitely gonna be moving towards electric vehicles of some sort, whether those are battery powered vehicles or they're hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. There's going to be a mix of them. There was a study uh, done by McKinsey a couple of years, uh, uh, 18 months ago, where they uh, interviewed 18, I'm sorry, 400 um, executives in the auto industry about where they thought things were gonna fall out in terms of, of electric vehicles, battery powered vehicles, hybrids, uh, internal combustion engines, hydrogen fuel cells. 25% in, in, by 2020, 30, the expectation is that 25% of all vehicles on the road are gonna be hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. 25%, 26% are gonna be battery 
uh, electric powered vehicles. And those, oh, the, the, those are only beneficial to the environment if you're using alternative energy sources, right? If you're using coal to create electricity for your battery powered car, all you've done is move your CO2 footprint from your tailpipe back to the power station. So we're creating energy uh, and a hydrogen that produces a zero um, emissions and produces a very low carbon footprint in, along the way. So, uh, so again, we're really not in the waste industry, we're in the solution business. Now, the, the nice thing is we get paid for our feedstock and then, of course, we get paid for the electricity and we get paid for the hydrogen. The, the fact is that our facilities are low capital cost, something in the neighborhood of five to eight million pounds per unit, per, per modular unit, that's producing between one and two megawatts per, uh, of exportable electricity uh, per hour. And that is that it, which would power 1,500 to 3,000 homes here in the UK, and we're produ producing between one and two tons of hydrogen per day. So, in any case, <laughs> I'll stop. I'll stop I was talking. Say, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We will. We've got some. Um, we've we've got, got all night. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> we've got some time to talk to the afters, and we've got some alcohol waiting. So I'm going to try and keep the the questions now quite quick, and if we can. I think Prem Biomass would love to say a bit more, I think. Have you got a question at the end for them? Let's hear the floor, because they've been yeah. very patient. Let's hear the floor. Um, what would be your cost per tonne, then, of the Napier grass pellets? Napier grass pellets at Ghanaian port. Presumably your first new <coughs> revenue is these longer-term off-take contracts. That's right, European yeah. European utilities. So we're looking at a uh, price between 40, uh, 30 and $40 per ton of napier grass pellet at port. Uh, we'll be selling, uh, selling at uh, around 80 to $90 per ton. And, what, and you said you're in a rural area, so how far is the, the growth of the napier grass? You said it's in rural areas, how far would that so be? So it's, uh, it's between 150 to 160 kilometers. I think those numbers need some work because I'll be, uh, yeah. I'm in the biomass industry and I'll, I'll be sure that your cost of pelletizing would probably be in the region of $30 a tonne before you've planted or moved anything mm -hmm. at that stage. Okay. If you get, we're going to, we'll ask. I'm going to be around so we can all chat later. Yeah. All, all I want to ask Keith is that, is it a problem for you to deal with your potential users? hydrogen fuel producing plastic, fuel producing plastics in the UK is not a renewable fuel. Are they bothered by that? No, not at this juncture. The fact is that it's low carbon hydrogen that's being produced. Hydrogen that's being produced through other mechanisms like steam methane reformation, which is the principal method by which hydrogen is produced, is generating between 12 and 16 tons of CO2 per ton produced. We're producing less than a third of that I understand that, but some, some users, some institutional users of vehicles need the accreditation of being a renewable fuel. In, indeed, and so there we may, we may run into some challenges. We're working with the government to look closely at how we look at second-use plastic and how do we get ourselves out of the crisis that we're currently in. Uh, yes, I, th I think you mentioned that Toyota are working on fuel <coughs> cell cars. Yes. Uh, but you also said that the technology is not quite there yet. How far ahead do you see that? Or do you hope so, that it's going to happen? Yeah, yeah the, the technology is there. So fuel cells are operating in California, they're operating in Japan. What they haven't done is built their factory floors out, and that's what they're in the process of investing billions of dollars into. Uh, the EU, uh, or uh, last year in Davos, Switzerland, 39 companies came together to create the Hydrogen Council that committed to uh, invest 10.3 billion euros in building a hydrogen infrastructure for the fueling of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So the technology is there. It's starting to become uh, cost effective. But again, we believe that industrial transport is where the uptake is going to be because it makes more sense at this juncture. We, we have fuel cell buses here in London. Indeed you do. There, there, there are fuel cell, and, and 
uh, we, we have an MOU with, uh, with a, a fuel cell bus manufacturer in Northern Ireland, Wright Bus. And so um, the, our intent is to provide low carbon hydrogen for the, for the decarbonization, if you will, of public transport. And the EU is heavily focused on decarbonization of transport. At the back, just behind you. Um, Keith, sorry, I know, um, you mentioned before in terms of your process, you, you've got, is it 1% waste? Yes. What is done with that waste um, in terms of how you manage that waste? So it depends on, the, on, on what that waste really is, right? It if, if, if it has a high concentration of zinc or something of that nature, then it needs to be handled as a hazardous waste and, and is handled appropriately. We're working on technology to ensure that we can extract any valuable commodity from any of the feedstocks that we're operating with. But the majority of the waste that we've been seeing through all of the testing that we've been doing over the last 18 months with our new generation of technology is that, this, that the end product, uh, the, the residual waste is non-leachable, non-toxic, and can be handled through mechanisms that already exist in terms of putting it, either putting it into landfill, putting it into construction, putting it into a variety of mechanisms that, uh, that allow us to get it off site. So it's, it's not something, it, this is not like, here's, here's a pond full of dioxin, right? We, this is not the kind of technology that we're dealing with. We end up with, with a clean residual waste that is manageable through existing means. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. Very good evening, uh, panel. Thanks for the opportunity. Just um, interested to know what sort of uh, investment would be required to create the infrastructure um, needed to make um, this sort of um, alternative green energy, both hydrogen um, ecologically and economically viable um, long term. Uh, well, as well as likely here in UK, it's uh, he, 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 there's a large investment needed. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to so be. How, how much do you need for one site? So one site, going? look for for between five and eight million uh, pounds, we can be generating a ton of hydrogen a day. That generates a, a, a ton plus. That that hydrogen will generate six thousand hgv miles of transportation. Um, that it'll generate electricity for between 1,500 and 3,000 homes. And so, and that's one truck movement of plastic per day and about 8,000 pounds. Now, to create the infrastructure that's going to be necessary for the entire population of the UK, you're talking about a massive infrastructure project. Massive infrastructure projects are billions of pounds. Right? And you're going to be looking at billions of pounds to upgrade a couple of things. Right? A couple of things that have to be upgraded for renewable energy to make any sense in this country or in any country. One is, is the electrical transmission grid. If you're going to be exporting or, or importing wind power from offshore and bringing it down from Scotland, then you've got to have a grid that's going to handle it. You've got to have a grid that extends into rural areas where people want to power their cars. The same is true with the gas grid. The national gas grid has to be upgraded. It, hydrogen embrittles steel, and so you can only put hydrogen through steel pipes for a period of time before it, it is too brittle for that hydrogen to, to be contained. So you have to upgrade the pipe uh, system. So there's, there is a massive project in front of us. In the meantime, we're happy to create a hydrogen fueling station for a fleet of 30 trucks and power them and take that CO2 component out of the atmosphere. Because as I had said earlier, there's not a silver bullet. We all have to do our piece. And all of those pieces have to add up to finally solving the problem. So I think, I mean, that, that is a good point. I think doing everything in little bits and doing every little thing that we do helps. And the more little things that we do, uh, yeah. eight million pounds at a time, will make a difference. So the more of these that go on, and the, instead of needing to necessarily do the massive scale, 
lots and lots of people do these small scale projects, that will make a difference. So I think it's time to wrap up now. I think we've had a really good, interesting discussion and I want to thank all the panellists for being thank here. You. Thank you again to Next for uh, hosting the event for us. And I believe there are time to chat to all of us again in the, in the other room and there's some nice alcohol for us all. Thank you thank all. You.